Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and joining me in person today is... Austin Davidson. How are you doing, Austin? I'm doing good. What's good, everybody? It's season two, episode 54. We are sitting on the first floor of my mom's uh, townhouse in uh, Bridgeville, Pennsylvania. That's what, it's, that's what it's called. It took me a second there. And uh, it's Saturday night. It's about to be Sunday morning. And uh, we're ready for the Steelers game against the Ravens, Austin. Sunday night football. Big time, right? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. We're going to be there, obviously. We've said it several podcasts. It's going to be a really fun time. Looking forward to it. We're hoping to have a live stream going on there. Uh, season 2, episode 54. The Steelers, first and foremost, let's talk about it, Austin. They have a chance to clinch the AFC North with a victory over the Ravens on Sunday for the second year in a row. Also have a chance to clinch a playoff spot if the Bills lose to the uh, Colts at a 1 o'clock start. But I think we'll be more interested in the game uh, Sunday night, obviously. So just what are your quick thoughts on that, given where the Steelers have been this season? Yeah, we're obviously hoping for a win against the Ravens rather than a Buffalo loss. I mean, if it comes down to it, we're going to be rooting for a Buffalo loss first since that happens at 1 p.m. But, I mean, I think we want the Steelers to be fighting for this number one pick all the way... uh, Number one pick, I apologize. Number one seed all the way down because they're competing with the Patriots right now for that. And if they lose... Basically, they're going head-to-head with the Patriots. If they lose this, they're going to be... Even if they win against the Patriots, it's not setting them up well because the Patriots don't lose often, so... We're obviously hoping for them to win here. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I guess just on the season as a whole, the Steelers are 10-2 and coming into this matchup. Kind of crazy with all the turmoil the Steelers have gone through this year, and now you add into that the devastating injury to Ryan Chazier. Probably the worst you would feel about a 10-2 and team ever, wouldn't you say? Yeah, the Ryan Chazier injury really brings down team morale and every, every fan's morale. You really, you're, we're still worried about if Chazier can walk for the rest of his life, his quality of life and stuff, so we're really worried. Yeah, definitely put a dampener on things, and then outside of that, it feels like there's been a lot to complain about with this team, like things, feel if, if you would have talked to a lot of fans, a lot of Yinzers, if you will, it seem as though this, this team would be the opposite, 2-10, and 10, not 10-2, and 2. but through it all, the Steelers have won, uh, gosh, what is it now, seven straight games? I believe so, but I'm not completely sure. On they that. were three and two, so they're now ten and two. So yeah, seven straight wins. So we'll get into that game in a few minutes, but let's get started with some other news around the NFL. The Falcons won over the Saints on Thursday Night Football. Anything you want to talk about with that quickly? No, Alvin Kamara went down, which is awful for fantasy owners, and he's been really fun to watch. And he was coming back up to be Offensive Rookie of the Year, so that's something to monitor. I think it's only a concussion, so it shouldn't be too too bad, but we'll see. He's still such a dynamic player. Uh, he's really a lot of fun to watch, and it's uh, not the Mark Ingram's a scrub by any means, but they're just so much better when they're together as opposed to not being together. Uh, outside of that, the Browns just recently fired their general manager and immediately hired former Kansas City Chiefs general manager John Dorsey. Uh, Dorsey responded in his first day by immediately placing wide receiver Kenny Britt on waivers and stating that finding a quarterback is his top priority, as it has been for the Browns since they returned to Cleveland in 1999. So what do you think about those couple of moves, and uh, what do you think about the Browns already basically saying that they are ready to move on from Deshaun Kaiser? Uh, well, firstly, I'll start with Kenny Britt. Uh, he's done nothing all year, and sees the Brown, fi- Browns $5.5 million dollars. So why not do it? Josh Gordon is back and actually looked decent in his return, and they still have Corey Coleman, who I personally like, so I like that move. In terms of switching GMs, I think it's necessary. Browns are headed for 0-16 and and needed to change something up, so why not bring someone who's, who was actually in charge of a winning team at one point? And the funny thing is, they couldn't even escape drama past just firing their GM. They got accused of breaking the Rooney rule, or, or of not interviewing a minority coach as the Rooney rule uh it, that's what it implements you're supposed to uh you're supposed to interview one minority coach and they immediately got in trouble for that because they almost in no time hi- hired John Dorsey they were cleared of it uh, the NFL cleared them but still there's drama surrounding it so what do you think about all these moves that the Browns made well thank you Austin I really wasn't aware that uh the Browns had potentially violated that rule and thank you for explaining that to our listeners 
Uh, as far as Kenny Brick goes, I don't really think he had any place on this roster. You covered it pretty much. Josh Gordon's reemergence this year, plus Britt's pretty much just plain ineffectiveness, meant he had no place on the team. Beyond that, I think it's a good idea to bring in a general manager who's had success in the past. Uh, I haven't seen much from the Browns this year, but I thought Deshaun Kaiser played well, but granted they were playing the Steelers in Week 1, and the Steelers didn't look all that great in Week 1, but I would still think it's probably a little too early to give up on a quarterback who you drafted in the second round, but who knows? The Browns have had the misgivings of the quarterback position for a long time now, so maybe that that is the right move is to just keep going with another one. Outside of that, Probably the most anticipated matchup of the year on the NFC side, if not one of the most anticipated matchups. Last year, a couple of quarterbacks that, well, especially one that really struggled last year, Austin and Jared Goff. It's the Rams and the Eagles and Carson Wentz for NFC supremacy. The Eagles, having just recently fallen off the top of the NFL's totem pole, who were 10 and 1, now 10 and 2. The Rams at the third seed at 9 and 3. I guess, first of all, who's having a better season uh, between these two teams? And beyond that, I guess, who's be- who's been more impressive to you? Well, both Carson Wentz and the Eagles have had better seasons than Jared Goff and the Rams. It's just that Wentz has been on fire and should be the MVP of, of the league this season. But also, just to interject as something not related, Russell Wilson might be coming for that from the bottom. But... Uh, not that Goff and the Rams are bad in any regards. I'm excited to see what they could do in the playoffs. I just think that the Eagles are the better team at the moment. I think Carson Wentz has a hotter hand. So that's what I'm going with. What do you think? Well, to put it simply, the Eagles and Carson Wentz have had the more impressive season to date. Uh, you know, 10 wins, starting 10-1 and one is definitely impressive. Uh, they rolled through their schedule, but I'm going to have to say that I think Goff and the Rams have been more impressive to me this season just because of where they were at this point a year ago. Jared Goff won, I think, 1-7 and or 0-7 in his starts last year, and he really just kind of looked lost as a quarterback. And now he's a kind of under-the-radar, dark horse at best kind of MVP candidate. He's having outrageous numbers compared to where he was at last year. And that's not to say Wentz wasn't having you know an awful year last year, too, and he hasn't turned it around. He, he had a decent year last year, but... Uh, I think he's probably the MVP of the league. Can we also have a discussion about that, Austin? Sure. Uh, too often, I feel like the MVP is about the quarterback position. Is Should the NFL kind of go to a point where the MVP can be kind of like quarterbacks, running backs, or whatever, or just quarterbacks, and then the offensive player of the year can be a different position, like not quarterbacks? I feel like that would make it more interesting because it feels like quarterback, since it's the most important uh, position on the field for most teams and most people in their opinion uh, that it gets factored into both when they sh- probably should make an award where it takes them out and leaves all the skill po- other skill positions in but it's it's funny to note that a wide receiver has never won the MVP but you know who has won an MVP? A kicker. Uh, I believe it was the Redskins kicker his name is now escaping me. I believe it was Morris or something like that. I I can't remember, but that was during the NH uh, the NHL the NFL's lockout year in the 1980s, and it's just crazy that a wide receiver has never. Uh, I got it right here for you, Austin. Mark Mosley from 1982, the Washington Redskins place kicker. But looking at all these, it's been, you know, a bunch of quarterbacks, a bunch of running backs, a defensive tackle, Alan Page of the Minnesota Vikings in t- 1971. I see a place kicker and Lawrence Taylor, the linebacker. So, all right, it's essentially just a quarterback and running back driven uh, award with one linebacker, one defensive lineman, and one place kicker, oddly enough. So that means no no, re- no receivers, no tight ends, obviously no offensive lineman, no defensive uh, lineman. Or no, sorry, the one defensive lineman, one linebacker, no defensive backs. And there would be ridiculous, no punters. So... I don't know if MVP should only be receivers. Maybe it could be, like, the offensive player of the year as a quarterback. I don't know. I just I feel like that should be split up. Maybe it's, like, an MVP could be a running back, receiver, or quarterback. But if they someone from that position group wins it, maybe they can't win offensive player of the year. I feel like that would make sense. I feel like it, it, it kind of gets tiring seeing a quarterback win every year. Like, Antonio Brown should have more uh, consideration this year. Even it, it probably sounds like a homer saying that, but... People are talking about how Antonio Brown should be considered. So I feel like 
if if there was an award split up somehow that a quarterback wouldn't win both, he could possibly win. I mean, he has a good chance at Offensive Player of the Year, but still, I feel like he's a league MVP. Like, he is almost single. He doesn't need it. He doesn't yeah. need that award then. Yeah, exactly. Or that, the important. Defensive Player of the, of the Year award, I suppose. But then the same argument goes. If you win the MVP award somehow as a linebacker, how would you not win Defensive Player of the Year? It's just the opposite precedence where because quarterbacks win so often – they're almost expected to, or running backs are expected to, like when Adrian Peterson went over 2,000 yards a few years ago. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I don't know, it's just something interesting I, I wanted to talk about before we move on to our next point. Uh, beyond that, the Jets are currently sitting at 5-7, and seven, and that's kind of surprising for a lot of people. Everyone seemed to think the Jets were going to go 0-16 this year, but a big part of their play this season has been their 38-year-old quarterback, Josh McCown. Offensive coordinator John Morton said, uh, I guess technically yesterday, that he would like to see him back next year. Should the Jets roll with McCown as their starter next year? Well, Josh McCown has actually done decently and just won AFC Offensive Player of the Week, which is very impressive. I think the Jets should still draft a quarterback early in this draft with all the good quarterbacks available. However, I think Josh McCown should come back and be the starter next year still, as he's playing good and will give the Jets' time for a rookie to develop, and hopefully can, that rookie can start at the end of the season or maybe after the season ends. I, I'm a fan of letting quarterbacks develop for a little while before just throwing them in there. I thought the problem with Jared Goff in, was because he was just thrown into a failing system with a really bad offense But uh, when he was first debuted, obviously. So I, I like the idea of keeping around McCown and not just drafting a rookie and throwing him in there. But uh, what do you think? Well, as uh, as long as bringing back McCown for the right price makes sense, I think it definitely makes sense. I just noticed our laptop chargers are the same color there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, Austin had mentioned how our laptops are pretty similar, and that that's something I just noticed. But in any case... The Jets should be wary because of what just happened to them a couple of years ago with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Coming off a career year, the Jets re-signed Ryan Fitzpatrick after a long holdout, and he stunk up the stunk up the joint, really. He didn't have a good season at all, and it hamstrung the Jets that season. And that led kind of to this uh, this situation where they had to dra- or, sorry, sign Josh McCown. So is there precedence for old quarterbacks like McCown having success for a couple of years? Yeah, there are. So I definitely see about bringing him back, especially since there aren't really any other proven options on the roster. And you do, you you do really don't want to throw a, a young quarterback into that kind of a dumpster fire, if you will. Although I guess the Jets really can't be considered that because of the way they've played. But you still don't want a rookie quarterback without many options around him. So I think bringing back McCown at 39 would be a good idea, but you don't want to overpay for him because if that goes downhill, you it's going to look ugly pretty fast. So now that we've looked at around the rest of the NFL, we can talk about the Steelers. So obviously the big news in Pittsburgh this week has been the health of Ryan Shazier. It's been on everyone's mind. Uh, I know Monday night's game was definitely overshadowed by it, but the basically the last news since our last podcast was that uh, Shazier was able to be uh, taken to UPMC Medical, the UPMC Medical Center where you got emergency spinal stabiliza- stabilization surgery, my apologies, uh, and that effectively ends his season. So basically that type of surgery, from what we understand, is needed to basically put uh, spine bones in the spine back in place if they've been dislocated. So that's not a good sign there, although the surgery was a success, uh, it sounds like. So at the very least, the swelling should start going down. It's a month month long a few months long as far as the recovery process go i don't remember how many three or five it could be a while uh but chazier is going to miss some time obviously so his season is over with so expect him to go to injured reserve sometime in the next week or so uh now the question shifts to more about is chazier going to be able to make a full recovery uh there aren't no one's really sure at this point uh i guess it kind of ranges from Maybe he'll be able to walk again, To Maybe he could play football again. Honestly, it's tough. We don't really know. We don't really have any answers at this point. All we know is that it seems as though the worst-case scenario probably is uh, gone by the wayside, right? Uh, I apologize, what? 
isn't it is it true that the worst case scenario has kind of been ruled out? Because uh, like when I know that he needed the surgery, but they probably would have operated sooner had it been more serious. Yeah, doctors. Uh, the doctors said that he may never be able to return to a football career. So it's not worst case scenario of him not walking. I believe has been ruled out, but uh. But by them saying that, but I'm not completely sure if that is ruled out. They we, just said he might not be able to. We don't want to speculate ball. too much, but we, I feel like we would have heard more about that. But at the same time, it's obviously a very touchy subject. The other thing to consider is that Shazier's mental health is also of the utmost importance, given the fact that he's have had such a life altering injury. It seems as though his family and friends have kept him in their thoughts, and uh, they've been uplifting for him. So that's good. But it's a, again, it's months long of recovery. And he may never recover to be the person or player that he once was. So we'll have to see. But obviously, you know, keep him in your thoughts. We'll uh, keep we'll keep you updated as things uh, move along. But we're hoping for the best for Ryan and uh, hopefully for a speedy recovery. Uh, beyond that, as far as the rest of the injury report goes, it's pretty short. Not too much going on for Pittsburgh Austin. Uh, the guys who are missing the game, obviously Shazier and Joe Hayden, as we know. Tyler Medikevich has been ruled out, the backup linebacker for Shazier with a shoulder injury. Not sure how long he'll be out for. And then Mike Mitchell's questionable with an ankle injury. I think you and I both suspect he's going to go. On the Ravens side, a couple of linebackers, C.J. Mosley and Zadarius Smith with uh, neck and shoulder injury, respectively. Offensive lineman Jermaine Illuminor, I believe is how you say that, shoulder. And Jeremy Macklin is questionable with a back injury. He hasn't been healthy all year. I'd have to imagine that with Shazier probably going on injured reserve next week, it sounds like a 50-50 chance Joe Hayden plays next week, which I know we don't really need to talk about given we know how big his return would be for this defense. So Steelers, Ravens, Austin, primetime football. We uh, already went over the series history earlier in the year since they played in week four, but just a fun fact, if the, if the Steelers do manage to prevail tomorrow, they would sweep the regular season series with the Ravens for the first time since 2008 when the Steelers last won the Super Bowl. The Steelers went 6-0 and in the division that, y- that year and would be 5-0 and with a win on Sunday, leaving only a home game against the Browns. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as the offense goes, Austin, they're going to be without Juju Smith-Schuster, who was suspended for a game for his crackback block and taunting on Vontez Perfect. How do you think this unit's going to kind of do without him, and what do they have to look forward to against the Ravens? Well, Antonio Bryan is off the injury report, and that's all that matters for the offense, really. Sure, Juju Smith-Schuster is out, and that isn't favorable, but with Jimmy Smith out for the Ravens, Antonio Brown may actually go off. Traditionally, Jimmy Smith has been one of the few cornerbacks to be Brown's kryptonite. And with him out, Brown has a chance to really eat here, even if they are the number three passing defense, the Ravens. Uh, That doesn't mean that I think the Steelers will avoid the run, though. Since the Ravens are much worse at rush defense than pass defense, and uh, Bell could go off like he did the first time. There's 144 rushing yards and two touchdowns. But there's one key difference that will make it hard for Bell to do that. Brandon Williams. Brandon Williams is back this time. The Ravens, excellent run stuffer. He may be a huge difference maker in this game, as Bell gashed the Ravens last time. Uh, other than that, where I expect the offense to really struggle is having other receivers step up. It's been the uh, sort of the tone of all season, the theme. This defense is undoubtedly one of the best in the league, especially against the pass. With Martavis Bryant at number two and Eli Rogers in the slot, I have no confidence. Maybe with Vance McDonald returning, he will help with the passing game, but that has shown not to be a strong suit. Uh, he has proved to be better as a blocker than as a receiver, so I don't have high expectations for him either. Uh, per usual, it's going to be up to the killer bees to carry this offense, in my opinion. So what do you have to look forward to in the offense in this game? Is there a favorable matchup? What do you think? Just listening to what you were just saying just kind of made me realize that this sounds exactly like last year's offense as far as what the main problem was. Yep. Uh, man, that's not good. Uh, there's no doubt that the strength of this Ravens team is their defense, and it's one of the better units in the NFL. That being said, they're possibly going to have to be without C.J. Mosley, their inside linebacker, and even if he does play, he's not going to be at his best. So the Steelers are probably going to want to attack the intermediate metal in middle. And better yet, the Ravens are going to be without their top cornerback, Jimmy Smith, as Austin pointed out, who has had success covering Antonio Brown in the past. 
So you can bet Roethlisberger is going to be looking his way early and often. That is a favorable matchup, but elsewhere I'm I'm honestly pretty concerned. Outside of Martavis Bryant, occasionally, the Steelers really haven't gotten much out of anybody in the passing game this year. Certainly not from Vance McDonald, who is coming back from injury, but I think he only has five catches on the year. Uh, you hope he can add a little more, but I'm not pretty confident about that. And Le'Veon Bell had a big game against the Ravens on the ground week four, 135 yards, I believe. 144. 144 yards on 35 carries, that's what it was. Uh, it's going to be difficult to recreate that, though, with Brandon Williams back in the lineup for the Ravens. I think the return of McDonald will help in the running game, but I'm worried about the consistency in which the Steelers' offense is going to be able to move the ball and score because of their lack of proven options over the course of the year outside of Brown on the outside. Even without Jimmy Smith, I think the Ravens are really dangerous on defense, and no team excuse me, has more interceptions than the Ravens do this season. Couple that with the fact that Ben Roethlisberger has thrown an interception in each of his last five games against the Ravens. That's something to be concerned about. Uh, the Steelers' rushing attack has also been honestly kind of disappointing since the Bengals win in Week 7, uh, excluding the Packers game from a few weeks ago. So I'm still concerned about their ability to generate a consistent rushing attack. Uh, yes? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll just finish up, and I just want to add something at the end. No, yeah, I'm all set. I, I go right ahead. You know what I've been thinking lately? I've been thinking about how much this team actually misses Kobe Hamilton. I wouldn't, I never thought I'd say that, but one of the team's biggest struggles has been on third down. And everything I remember from Kobe Hamilton was he'd get two catches a game. But you know where they would be? They'd be on third down. They would be those big catches that the Steelers need that just to, to convert. And I think the Steelers are really missing that kind of receiver this year. Because they don't really have anyone else that comes in to play like that. Because Kobe Hamilton would come in, catch those two passes, they'd be important, he'd go out. What the Steelers are left with are Justin Hunter, uh, Darius hayward Bay, who hasn't even done... He's only caught one pass this year, is on the trick play. And uh, Eli Rogers. And Eli Rogers hasn't been that guy. So I've really been thinking lately that the Steelers have missed Kobe Hamilton really bad to make those big third down catches. Yeah, boy, Kobe Hamilton is someone that you kind of came out of nowhere off the practice squad last year, but Austin is very, very, you know, he's he's right on the money here. He caught two touchdowns last year, uh, one being the last one of the regular season over the Browns. I've just pulled up a highlight video for him. But I know exactly what you're talking about. The loss to the Patriots in the regular season last year, he had two third-down conversions, one of, I think, seven yards and another was like 12 yards. I, I really do think he had a ton of third down conversions last year, and uh, he was an important player even if uh, if the Steelers no longer have him. Yeah, they definitely do miss that kind of element on their roster. Uh, it's not any of the tight ends, really. It's not Bell, obviously, since he's a running back, even if you can dump it off to him. It's pretty much Brown and Juju, I guess, but like their main options are not the specific third down guy. Brian had kind of an amazing catch on that uh, slant on the game-winning drive. I, I had to be honest, I was I think that was his most impressive catch of the night. I think so, too. I agree, because it was like the first contested catch he's made all year. Not really. That's an exaggeration. That, no, almost, though. It's like the first one he's ever made. Like He never runs those routes, and he, he made it while being brought to the ground, so that was pretty impressive. I was really proud of him for that. Um, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. So that's something we, we need to kind of look out for. Maybe... I don't know. It's always something with the offense, isn't it? On the other side of the ball, though, it's going to be quite an adjustment process for the defense, Austin. I, I don't know. Where do you What do you think about this? Defense on the other side of things will actually should have an easier time, but we need to address the giant gap here. The Steelers will undoubtedly miss Ryan Chazier. Keith Butler said Motes and Spence may share the duty, and that's not very hopeful. Since Motes is, Motes is more used to playing outside with little experience on the inside. He does have experience, just not a lot of it. And Spence has just been signed back to the Steelers. And while uh, Butler said that he uh, they didn't really change the system much and he's a quick learner, I'm just I'm, I'm still very worried. Uh, short routes on that side of the middle might destroy the Steelers, and, and runs up the middle that go that way may go, do that as well. The defensive line is going to need to stuff the run when it comes that way for most of the game to really keep it in check. Because I don't have much faith in the Moats spence fort combination that's going to be going on this week. As for the rest of the defense, the defensive back should 
should have it easy here. It will, what will be interesting to watch, however, will be who will be, uh, who will be starting on the other side of Artie Burns. Uh, with Keith Butler, uh, will I'm sorry, will Keith Butler elect to give Cody Sensible another shot or let rookie Cameron Sutton continue after having a solid second half once he came in? Uh, it will be something to watch. They may even split the reps. I, we'll see. As for the pass rush, uh, I expect them to struggle a bit here as they, uh, they, uh, I'm sorry. Despite all the injuries to the Ravens' offensive line, uh, I think they'll still struggle. Uh, it's been a decent year for the Ravens' offensive line, giving up ninth least sacks, even after everyone's been injured. But in my mind, I think they, uh, the Steelers' defense can get over it. So, uh, tossing it over to you, how do you think the defense is going to perform here? Well, the defense uh, is about to undergo quite the adjustment process. On top of losing one of its best players in Ryan Chazier, they just lost their signal caller, too. And we saw that on Monday Night Football, how the Steelers were struggling at times after he went out to get the communications across uh, between the rest of the defense. It felt like there were times they didn't know what they were doing. And that's really important to get a full week of practice in there. Uh, the Steelers are going to use a combination of whether it be Arthur Most, Sean Spence, like you just mentioned, or LJ Fort. And that's really not very inspiring as a Steelers fan or anyone who follows the team. Look, we know Motes is an outside linebacker in a 3-4 system. He played on, I believe, the insider out. It may have been the insider outside in a 4-3 in Buffalo, but that's different. If you even if you play on the outside in a 4-3, you're on the inside more. So, I guess he does have a little experience, but he hasn't played in a 4-3 since at least 2000, what, 13? Yeah, 2013 when he was in Buffalo. So, He's definitely not as fast as he was then. You're not really sure how that's going to work. Fort is a special teams player who, while athletic, you're not, you don't really want him and thrust into that kind of situation. And Sean Spence, who, granted, is probably the best suited for the role at some point, but he also has uh, just joined the team. Even if he is familiar with the system, I wouldn't want him playing significant snaps for at least two weeks, maybe even three weeks, if that. So... It's going to be interesting to see how they fill up that extra linebacker position next to Vince Williams. Maybe teams are going to try to load up, try to play heavy football. I'd, I'd be really interested to see next week what the Patriots try to do. But you definitely have to think the Steelers are going to try to isolate those positions, make sure that they're not on the field very often. So we'll have to see how that works out. Luckily, though, for the rest of the defense, it should be a pretty advantageous matchup. Uh, the Ravens have one of the worst offenses in the entire league. I was looking at the Ravens' uh, schedule this year. Joe Flacco has more games where he has less than 200 yards passing than he has more. So uh, that's really bad. Uh, he, Oh, sorry. The Ravens have one game with a 100-yard rusher and two games with a 100-yard uh, receiver. Mike Wallace and Alex Collins being those players. Uh, looks like you have something you wanted to say. No? Okay. Sorry, my, my bad. I thought uh, I thought there was something you wanted to add to that. They've been awful, and they managed only nine points at home against the Steelers in Week Four. Jeremy Macklin potentially missing this game would be, you know, just another blow for an offense that has really struggled this year. And you know, outside of that, if you if you take away Jeremy Macklin, you have Mike Wallace, who is older. He's still producing, but not at the level he once was in Pittsburgh. And you have Benjamin Watson, who's averaging under eight yards a catch, which is not anything inspiring at all. And then on the ground, it's just stopping Alex Collins. Maybe Michael Campanera on the, one of those end-around jet sweep plays, but, I mean, they're going to run that three times a game, maybe, at most. No one really s scares me here, but it do it is true the Steelers are going to be without Shazier, and that's a an adjustment process for sure. But I think they're going to play better. I think they're going to play inspired football. And I think that playing a struggling offense is going to be a good litmus test for them, and it's going to help them figure out what works for them. On top of the fact of you know maybe what they have, it'll help teach them what they have at that position, uh, even if uh, it doesn't go very well. So I think I think they'll have a good amount of success. Uh, the last question for me, I know you brought this up, was Cody Sensabaugh or Cameron Sutton? If I personally had to guess, Austin, I'm guessing Sensabaugh gets a start here. Would you agree? I'm actually thinking that, too. I, I was really debating it. I think that they're going to go back. I think that Cody is the starter there with uh, Hayden out, and I think that they're going to give him the starting role back because he has more experience and stuff. They just needed to bench him for that game because he wasn't doing well. 
He's been doing okay despite that game, so I think they're going to go back to him. Plus, Sutton might have just been a better matchup. I don't know if Sutton's faster than uh, Sensabaugh, but at the very least, Sensabaugh just didn't have it that night, and it was pretty obvious. Uh, he hasn't been great the rest of the time he's been in, but he also has given up big plays, too, so that's something you want to keep an eye out for, too. I do think Tomlin's going to err on the safe side this week, but I do think they're going to have a good game. As far as the special teams go, Austin, we covered this pretty well the last time these two teams played. Not much has changed, but this is a good special teams unit under John Harbaugh, as it always is. I agree. Uh, Justin Tucker is probably the best kicker in the league still. So Sam Cook is another good punter, just under 46 yards per punt return. Bobby Rainey averaging 27 yards per kick return. Uh, so that or No, 30 yards. My apologies. The team is averaging 27 yards a kick return. And Michael Campanero is their usual punt returner. He's been good, too. I believe 13 yards per punt return. So look out there. What's the Steelers' offense? What's their key to success on Sunday, Austin? It's to don't give up on the rush early. Uh, when Bell doesn't rush a lot, Steelers tend to lose. It's just a statistic. I think it's under 15. If he gets under 15 carries in a game, the Steelers are... Uh, they've never won a game with uh, with that stat line, so uh, the Steelers will need to keep the the rush going because the Ravens' defense is weakest against the run as well. So attack them where they are weak. What is your offensive uh, key to the game? Attack the middle, and it's true that Brandon Williams is back for the Ravens' defense, but either without C.J. Mosley or a hampered C.J. Mosley, you want to make him try to make the plays to beat you. Normally he probably could when healthy, but when he's hurt or slowed down like he might be, I'd be a lot less confident about his abilities to make stops and to make plays in the passing game. Attack there, and if the Ravens attempt to cheat there a little bit, then hit him on the outside. On the other side, Austin, I'll jump right into mine. It's make the tackle. The play that frustrated me the most last week was a play that didn't technically happen because of penalty. It was the play that I believe Artie Burns and uh Cameron Sutton were back, which I thought it confused me because there were two cornerbacks back there at first. Uh, yeah, Cameron Sutton was actually the guy on him. Artie Burns saw that it was breaking down and actually came from his man and uh, went to go try and make the tackle. The reason, at first, I blamed Artie Burns because I saw him there first and I saw him miss the tackle. It's, so, a, Steeler, it's a Steelers fan's like natural reaction yeah, at this it's point. Yeah, it's a natural. But, so Artie Burns still missed the tackle, but it was Cameron Sutton's responsibility. So... Cameron Sutton's to blame there. Was that a cover zero then, I guess, or there was no safety back there? Uh, I honestly can't remember. I, I just remember seeing that Artie Burns came off his guy. I wonder. That's something we'll have to take a look at at some point. But that play really bothered me because, again, a missed tackle, a big play to give up is bad enough, and then not being able to make the tackle when they were both right there and then A.J. Green basically stopped, looked at them, and then started running the other way and they couldn't tackle him. That bothered me, even if the play was called back. So make the tackle. Again, for a few weeks now, we've seen the Steelers have given up big plays, which are bad enough, but it's so much worse when you turn a 50-yard gain into a 70-yard gain and touchdown just because you can't get the guy on the ground. So the Steelers need to make sure that if they give up the big play, which I'm assuming they'll give up one or two because that's just the way it goes now, make the tackle. They have to make the tackle. What's your key for the defense, Austin? It's to stop the runs down the middle before they get to the second level. I don't want the Ravens to attack the Steelers where they are a little bit beat up at the moment. So they're gonna really need to. Uh, they're going to need to really focus on stopping the run before it gets to the inside linebackers, which I'm having a little bit of uh, panic over. But moving on. What, what? Who is your offensive X factor for this game? My X factor on offense is Vance McDonald, who's hopefully coming back from injury. Hasn't played since the Colts game. It's looking like uh, McDonald is going to be back, so that'll be a huge boost for the run game, hopefully. The Steelers' numbers with him in the lineup are much better on the ground. Uh, as far as the passing game goes, I'm hopeful he'll be a little more impactful than he has been this season. Uh, you know, the track record doesn't... Su- suggests that but all it takes is a couple plays and it'll be uh it'll be a big day for mcdonald but his performance will be big uh with the loss of juju smith schuster due to suspension so his play could very well make or break the offense uh who's your x factor on offense austin mine is eli rogers he's been quite the disappointment this season if not the biggest disappointment this season for the sealers but i'm gonna make him my x factor and one last showing of hope for him to step up here if he can do what juju normally produces that could really swing the game. And what I'm really looking for when I say what Juju normally produces, 
is roughly about four or five catches. Juju didn't even have that much yards last year. Uh, last year, last game, he had five catches for seventeen yards, or was it four? Yeah, four for seventeen, but usually one 17. or two of those is a big third down conversion. And that's usually what you're looking for, yeah, at least one. Exactly. I'm looking for Eli Rogers to convert a big third down. As we said earlier in the podcast, it's been the Steelers' struggle, and we need a receiver that can actually convert a third down other than Antonio Brown. So uh, I'm leaving it to him. Uh, who is your defensive X factor? The stats won't tell it, or sorry, the tape won't tell it, but the stats will. Javon Hargrave has been pretty quiet for the last couple weeks. And I know that, you know, nose tackles aren't going to pile up st- sacks and statistics, but he just had, he's stuck on two sacks, which is his career, tied for his career high right now. I feel like he hasn't been as noticeable, whether or not that's his fault for not playing or just not playing well enough. I think that he's going to be pretty important in this game. You know the Ravens like to run the ball. They don't have much of a passing attack. And with the, without Ryan Chazier, you're going to need a bigger game from someone who's going to try to free up those linebackers behind him. And I think Javon Hargrave is going to have a big game. But even if he doesn't, it's uh, clear that he's going to be an important person for the defense. What about you, Austin? Who do you have on defense that's going to make or break this team? Uh, I actually have two. It's kind of a, an or, starts, yeah. or situation. <laughs> It's based on who starts at the cornerback opposing Artie Burns. Cody Sensabaugh or Cam Sutton? There's no denying it. Cody Sensabaugh was playing bad last week. So if he, st- if he starts, he is my X actor because he will be able. To- he will need to be better even against the Ravens' bad receivers. And if it's Cam Sutton, he just needs to pick up where he left off last week. It's, it's just how it goes. There- so they're my X actor. Alrighty, Austin. It's time to move into our weekly pick 'em section. Uh, week 14 of the NFL season, moving right along. We'll start with the first game. I'm just checking the line on all of these now. Colts at Bills, a question mark of Tyrod Taylor's health uh, for the Buffalo Bills right now who are at home. At 6-6, six and six, having just lost to the Patriots, looking to get back into the playoff picture. Still no line score as of right now, 12.33 in the morning on Sunday. Uh, I'm going to take the Bills. I will give a final score since we don't have a line right now. I'll take the Bills to win 24. I'm going to actually change that to just a little bit different than what you have. Actually, you know what? No, never mind. I'm going to uh, make my prediction 24-20 Bills win. I'm going to go pretty similar. I have the Bills winning 28-20 by winning by four more points. Uh I just I I think it doesn't really matter. I think P- Peterman will have a better game if he comes in. I think he'll be less nervous. I think he can beat out this really bad Colts team. Game time decision for T- Tyrod, by the way, so we won't know. Yeah, the Colts are just not a good football team. At three and nine, it looks like they're headed for at best a four win season. Next game on the list: Bears at Bengals. The Bengals are still six and a half point favorites at home. At five and seven, their playoff hopes on life support. Austin, who do you got here? I have the Bears plus six and a half. I don't think the Bengals are a very good team, and they just lost Adam Jones for the year. So I have the Bears keeping it close. So the ba- the Bengals are still going to win. Just <clears throat> Bears keep it close. What do you got? The Bengals are going to win because of Mitchell Trubisky, and that's not a good thing for Trubisky. I don't think he's that good, at least not this year. Maybe we'll see more out of him next year, but I haven't been impressed with his play this year. On the other side, though, I'm taking the Bears to win, or not not to win outright, but six and a half because of the fact that, listen to the guys that the Bengals have out. You just mentioned Adam Jones. We talked about this earlier. They're also missing uh, Drake Kirkpatrick with a concussion, Joe Mixon, and Vontez Perfect. So that's four starters right there. Plus, I think they're missing at least a couple more. They're missing Joe, Joe Mixon if you didn't say him. I did, I did oh, mention him. If I, if I didn't, I meant to say him. But... Outside of that, I think they're missing another... Are they still missing Vigil? I don't know. I I didn't see any update on Vigil. I think he's still out, as far as I know. Well, regardless, that would mean the Bengals are rolling with just Giovanni Bernard since Jeremy Hill's out for the year. So that doesn't bode well for a team that needs to run the ball to have success. But I think they'll win just by the skin of their teeth. Packers at Browns. The Packers are three-point favorites. This will likely be the last week for Brett Hundley <laughs> under center. The Packers' playoff hopes... On life support as well. They really need to win this game to get into the playoffs or have a chance. But i got to be honest with you, Austin. If the Browns are going to win a game, it's going to be this week. 
right up by Lake Erie. I think the Browns turn in that, that game. I think this is the one they actually win, and this is obviously the last chance I think they really have. I'll double-check the rest of their schedule, but this is this is it for them, I think. So I'm just going to, you know, backs against the wall. <laughs> they, they really can't do much worse, can they? I mean, oh, man. They have, all right, here's who they have after this. They're home against Baltimore at Chicago at Pittsburgh. I think this has to be it. If they're going to win a game, it's going to be here, but I don't agree. I think they're finishing this season without a win unless unless the Steelers get a uh, a bye week that they can't change their position or it doesn't matter what they do if they win or lose. Like last year where they benched players, I think that's the only way they're going to win another game. So I have Packers covering in this game. I just think the Browns are bad and they should feel bad. Probably. I just... Just once, man. Can they win one game? No. <laughs> no. Raiders at Chiefs. Uh, let me double check and make sure this is still the line score for that one. All right. Chiefs, yeah, four and a half point favorites. I really wanted to go Chiefs to win here, but this is like the third, would be the third week in a row I picked the Chiefs to finally right the ship, and they just haven't done it. So I'll take the Raiders plus four and a half because I feel like this is going to be a really close game, even though the Chiefs technically have done a great job beating them over the last few years. The Raiders do have that win earlier in the season, even if it was a Thursday night game. It makes me nervous. I just, you know, the Chiefs haven't shown me enough to show that they can cover a four and a half point spread, especially against a division rival. So I'll take the Raiders plus four and a half. The Chiefs have ultimately imploded and the Raiders beat them the first time. I think they're going to do it again. Uh, the, this is also the Raiders are playing for the first in the division here. If the Raiders win their first in the division, I believe. I don't know if the char- the tiebreaker with the Chargers. If the tie if the Chargers win, they might be in first. I think the Raiders got it though. Luckily, I have the ESPN playoff machine right here, so we're gonna try to figure that out right now. So, let's say Chargers, and then Raiders. No, the Chargers would still be in first. Oh, okay, so. I guess the Raiders are fighting for They'd be tied. Uh, to, to be ahead for the Chiefs, ahead of the Chiefs still. So they would still have the same record, but I guess Chargers would be in front. Uh, I still think Chiefs aren't hungry anymore. Chiefs are dying. They can't run the ball. Yeah, they can't run the ball. They've given up on it several weeks in a row because they keep falling behind by so much. It's just bad. It is so bad. So Raiders went out right, in my opinion. Okay. Cowboys at Giants, the... Cowboys hung on to their uh, playoff hopes by beating the Redskins on Thursday night football. The Giants, having recently just un- undergone a firing of their GM and coach, Eli's streak is over. Uh, boy, this, uh, what, do you th- what do you make of this game? The Cowboys are three and a half point favorites. I honestly wanted to pick the Giants to win out right here. I almost did. But then I, I came to my senses that this is still a terrible football team. But that's just my personal opinion. What do you think, Austin? I lost my senses. I had the Cowboys covering, and I had just changed it to Giants win outright. I feel like last year the Giants had the Cowboys number, and I feel like the Giants can still pull it off. Dak hasn't been good without Zeke. Uh, the, their starter still Alfred Morris, and Des Bryant hasn't been that great in a while. So I'm going to pick the Giants to win outright here in, in an upset. Eli Manning's at the helm. Uh, they got this. You know, let me put it this way. If they, if the Giants did win, it also wouldn't really surprise me to see, like, that would just be the ultimate middle finger to Ben McAdoo. Just comes right out and just has, you know, a great game and dominates the Cowboys, something like that. I could definitely see it, like, the weight being lifted off their shoulders and all of a sudden everybody in New York City is like, well, Ben McAdoo was the problem, so... We'll see how that goes with the New York media. Detroit Lions coming off a whooping from the Ravens last week. At the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, this game also doesn't have a line right now because of the status of Matthew Stafford. Still not sure who's going to be starting. Do you know who his backup is? Is it Sean Hill still? Uh, I don't think it's Sean Hill. I don't actually know. I will figure that out. it, It might be Kaya. Brad Kaya? Is, is it Kaya or Kaya? I don't know. I always, I always said Kaya. Wasn't he know. released? I thought he was released. He, I thought he was released by the Panthers and then brought back. Possibly. We'll have to double check on that. But what's your final score prediction for the game? I, and Like, who do you assume is going to play, I suppose? I assume that Stafford's going to play because he wasn't marked as doubtful. He's marked as questionable. So I have the Lions winning 24-10 because the Buccaneers are bad and will be without TJ Ward. And it doesn't even matter. Their defense has been bad. 
So Lions 24-10, who do you have winning? Uh, just to answer your question, it's not Brad Kaya, it's Jake Rudock from uh, Miami. Wait, no. That oh. was Michigan. Michigan. That was the guy that they took from uh, the Vikings, isn't it? I am not positive, but it sounds like Stafford... No, it's from the Broncos. I'm, an, I'm stupid. Bra uh, Stafford is uh, set to play, but even if he doesn't, there's uh, Jake Rudock waiting in the wings. I, want, I wonder what happened to Sean Hill. I'm going to look that up, too. I took, I'm taking the Lions to win 28-23. I'm just not entirely confident in the Lions after last week. I really thought they'd win. I just really don't think highly of the Buccaneers at all, so I think the Lions are going to win, but it's going to be by a slim margin, 28-23. The Minnesota Vikings now in first place in the NFC at 10-2, and two, visiting the Carolina Panthers at 8-4. and four. Minnesota's getting 2.5 at home. Case Keenum's that quarterback, and he's played really well. Oh, I really want to pick the Vikings to cover, but I really also want to... I, I just don't see this team going 14-2, and two, so I'll take the Panthers to win outright in this one. I'm going to pick the Vikings to cover on this. On the flip side of things. I think the Vikings are the, the best team in the NFC after seeing the Eagles fall. I think Vikings' strength of victory has shown to me that... I, I was thinking it for a few weeks now. I was like, the Vikings are actually sneakily good, even with Case Keenum at the helm. And it's not even like Case Keenum is the bad part of them. It's it's really crazy because if they still had Dalvin Cook, this team, I think, would be clear favorites. It, and Jarek McKinnon and Latavius Murray haven't been that bad, to be honest. So I have the Vikings covering. I think they're the best team in the NFC. So. Wow, Sean Hill hasn't been on the Lions since 2013. <laughs> Sean Hill, the journeyman backup. I, I don't remember, like... Why I I remember him being the backup to Alex Smith. That's why <clears throat> in San Francisco he was with he was drafted by the Vikings. Was he drafted by the Vikings? He was with the Vikings in two thousand two. Niners in 06, Lions in twenty ten, Rams twenty fourteen, and the Vikings again at the end of his career. The last two years, he's currently a free agent though, thirty seven years old. Interesting to note that. Uh, last one o'clock game we have the Niners at the Texans. Uh, yeah, I know the Jimmy Garoppolo era started, and it started well for them, but I think the Texans finally seem to have gotten it, uh, gotten things under control. Tom Savage threw for over 300 yards last week. and uh, Did they win last week? No, they lost to the Titans, right? They threw a last-minute interception, Tom Savage did. Mm. <laughs> well, they might... They might. They still aren't a very good team, but it looks like they've at least gotten some patchwork done, so at least they can be a little competitive. They seem to get the get the idea on offense, get the ball to DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, that being said, Houston's a three point favorite, and I just don't have much faith in the Niners on the road. I think the Texans are going to cover in this one. I have to agree with you. Texans are covering here. I know the Jimmy Garoppolo did decently last week, but I don't think they're going to keep. He's going to keep it going this year. So, Texans cover. Four o'clock games now. The Titans at the Cardinals. Titans are three-point favorites on the road. The Cardinals are kind of sneaky good almost. They're in the wrong conference this year. I know we've said that before. But I will take the Titans to cover here just because I want to I want to see them get in ahead of the Jaguars personally. I actually have the Cardinals winning out right. Tennessee, I don't know. They're just a confusing team to me. I think I've said it several times uh, while doing this podcast that I always think the Titans are going to be good, and then they're not. I, every year I feel like they have the pieces, and they're just not. So I'm going to pick the Cardinals to win out right behind Blaine Gabbert. Let's see it happen. All right, Redskins at Chargers. I think this might be one of the most interesting games of the week. Uh, the Redskins, their playoff hopes are pretty much dashed. The Chargers, on the other hand, their playoff hopes are alive and well after starting 0-4. They will be in the division lead with a win and a Chiefs loss this week. Are they already in the division lead right now? Uh, the Chiefs lose their in the division lead right now. Chiefs have have the lead. They're all tied at six and six atop the division. Then the Raiders and the Chief, uh, Chargers. Well, the Chargers are home and they're getting five and a half. I'm actually going to take the Redskins plus five and a half because I looked at the Chargers, who they've beaten over the last few weeks, and it's not that impressive to me. Not that they aren't a good team or anything. I just don't think they might be as good as people think they are. So for that reason, I'll take the Redskins because they're also in a tougher conference. Plus I'm gonna, five and a half, sorry. Uh, I'm going to use the commutative property, and I'm going to say that because the Chargers beat the Cowboys, and the Cowboys ruined the Redskins last week when the Cowboys, I thought, are terrible, 
I'm going to pick the Chargers to cover here, and probably in a big way. That's my guess, so Chargers cover. Jets at Broncos, probably the snooze fest of the week. The Jets are actually only getting one point on the road. I'm kind of surprised about that, Austin. I think the Jets could win big here. The Broncos are a defeated and ugly football team. They got safety against twice <laughs> last week. Oh, four points against? <laughs> yeah. they, got the, they got the old four-pointers? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was nasty. I have the Jets covering, personally. I, I don't... I don't think the Broncos stand a chance. After seeing them get blown out by Miami, that was that was disgusting. What do you have? Oh, I have the same thing. Avert your eyes from this game, yeah. much like the Texans Cardinals game. Do not watch that game at all. Uh, we have a game of the year candidate in the Eagles and Rams. The Rams are one point favorites. The Eagles are coming off a tough loss. They had looked pretty much unbeatable for most of the season before that loss to the Seahawks last week. But. I'm going to take the Rams and Jared Goff. I really like him. Uh, Goff almost saved my fantasy team from extinction this year. My team was 1-7 and seven before he came in. We rattled off four straight wins. Just finished uh, short of the playoffs, so I'm, I'm disappointed in that. But I'm going to roll with my guy here, Jared Goff, and I think the Rams are going to cover just barely at home. I'm going to actually take the Eagles to win outright. I know the Eagles are getting a lot of flack for not having a hard schedule, but... Looking at how they've won, they're doing what they should against these bad teams. They are destroying these bad teams. And they had a, they lost against uh, the Seahawks. I think people are blowing that a little out of proportion. I hate the Seahawks, but they just know how to win key games. They know how to heat up at the end of the year. So I think that was harder than people think or are thinking because just how Seahawks started bad and how <laughs> that it's something like me that I make fun of the Seahawks like that, but... I think the Eagles are going to win out right here. I think they're going to surprise people. Or I guess maybe not. might not be a super surprise, but still. Just wanted to make a quick note. The Steelers are actually installed as four-and-a-half point favorites. That had been switching. It was four-and-a-half when we looked at this earlier in the week. Went up to five this morning, actually, and now it's back to four-and-a-half, so I just wanted to mention that quickly. <clears throat> uh, Seahawks at Jaguars. Jaguars two-and-a-half point favorites. I'm going to take the Seahawks to win outright as well. Um, look, this is going to be an interesting game between two teams that are kind of kind of similar as far as the makeup. They're both strong defensive teams. They don't have much going offensively. The difference is at quarterback in my mind. And Russ, I'll take Russell Wilson over Blake Bortles any day, and I'm pretty sure anyone with half a brain would, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's, that's a hard – You you got to give me a lot of money to take uh... – uh, what uh, Blake Bortles over Russell Wilson? Almost said Blaine Gabbard, didn't you? Yeah, I almost I was said Blaine that. Gabbard. I was thinking that too. <laughs> He's the Cardinal starter at the moment, but I have the Seahawks winning outright as well. I just think that the Seahawks are hot. They're heating up for the playoffs, which they normally do. So I think they're they might ride in a, a, a winning streak into this into the playoffs from here. So Seahawks win outright. Sorry, I, I had mentioned uh, I'll also take them because I I had heard you mention Seahawks. I was checking the line, so I thought, oh, you already talked about it. My apologies. <laughs> Patriots at Dolphins. That's the Monday night game. Uh, kind of odd. The These two teams are playing each other in a three-week span. I don't like that. Mm. Uh, it happened, I think, last in 2000, 2001 for the Patriots. Very strange. The Colts were in their division at that time, fun fact. Uh, I'll take the Patriots to cover. Look, the Dolphins are an okay team in the AFC, but the Patriots are just that juggernaut, and they just thrashed them a few weeks ago. Why won't they do it again, right? I can't see a reason why a Miami would do anything. Miami blew out the Broncos. If that's a big feat to someone, I I would like to have sit down and have a conversation and ask why. But I have the Patriots covering easy here. They did it the last time, as you said. And this is a smaller line than last time, so... Patriots cover. All right, uh, let's. It's the it's our game of the week as it is every week. Ravens at Steelers. Steelers can clinch the AFC North with a win for the second straight year over the Ravens at home. Uh, week fourteen, AFC North football: Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh Steelers. Bold predictions time, Austin. Who you got for your bold predictions? Let's give. Let's hear yours. Uh, my first one is Ben Rosberger has a 300-yard passing game against the Ravens for the first time since the 2014 AFC Wild Card game, and also adds on three touchdowns. My second is Vance McDonald has a 100-yard game. I am very 
uh, I don't believe that for a second. I, it was just really something, the first thing I could come up with. That's why they're bold. That's why they're bold. And then Cameron Sutton records his first pick as a Steeler, and it's a pick six. Even in limiting play, limited playing time, probably not going to be the starter because Cody Sensible will probably be starting. So what are your bold predictions? Uh, I'll give them to you in a second. Just a question about your final score prediction with uh, what you have as bold predictions, too. And then who do you think those three touchdown passes from Roethlisberger are going to? Uh, All three to McDonald? Please say that. Oh, 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 you know, what the heck, I'll go 100 yards on six catches. No way this happens, but we're going bold tonight. And I've done this before, but I'm, I'm saying it again. William Gay sets a new Steelers record with his fifth career pick six with the franchise, and who better to come against the Ravens? So I'm really hoping that he gets it. Although I hope Mike, Mike Hilton isn't off the field for too long either, because that would mean Mike <laughs> Hilton isn't playing either. So it's time for the final score prediction. The Steelers are four-and-a-half-point favorites at home. Austin, it's got all the makings of another close AFC North rivalry matchup between these two teams. A ton of close matchups over the years. Truly one of the best rivalries in all of football, especially over the past decade plus. Who do you got in this one? I have the Steelers winning 26-21. Uh, to 21. I'm also going to add another bold prediction because I realized for Ben Roethlisberger to, to throw three touchdowns and for it to end 26-21, that's a... a you're forgetting Cameron Sutton's pick six, so that's four touchdowns now. Oh God! You want to you want to think of we want to. No, problem? they're missing a they're missing a PAT or two. They're missing two. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're missing two. They're going PAT. for two. They're going for two. Oh uh, yeah, they're going for two. That's that's what we'll go with. So, uh, the Ravens plus five still, and I'll add those bold predictions All right. <laughs> that they're gonna go for two and miss Ho- it. Hopefully, some of them some of them <laughs> land. Like that's just what we're going for at this yeah. point. It's kind of hard to make bold predictions for these games, though. Yeah, it is but, really hard. You don't know where it's gonna <clears> swing. Uh, I'm taking the Steelers to cover 27-17. I think that pick six by William Gay, if I'm going to incorporate it in, is going to be the big difference. Uh, look, the Ravens just, they're awful on offense. They're, they've got nobody. Uh, they've been destroyed on the offensive line. Joe Flacco's having a bad year. Their best weapon could be missing the game. Mike Wallace is their other top target who is... There's no reason he should be getting big plays, and again, he just might, but he shouldn't. And on the other side, I think it's just a war of attrition for the Steelers' offense. That's what it was in Week 4. Just keep giving it to Bell, and eventually he broke through. I think it's a pretty simple recipe for the Steelers, but you know these games are always tough, they're always close, but it'd be so great to see the Steelers finally break through and sweep the Ravens for the first time in nine years. So, (laughs) excuse me. As far as that goes, Austin, I think we're all set for this special edition just remember that uh we'll be at the game obviously so we're hopefully going to do a live stream or two you know maybe we'll do one pre-game halftime end game we'll we'll have to see how things go i don't know how we're planning on doing it we're gonna we're gonna have an early morning to both of us it's finals week at college for us so that means we have to be heading home right away to get ready for finals so we're probably not going to be able to do a post-game show together unless we do it like in the car or something like that. I don't know what <laughs> we'll do. <clears throat> but we'll, we'll figure something out, but we just wanted to let you guys know about that. And I apologize, Julie. We haven't gotten around to sending the Funko Pop yet, but we're going to do that really soon again. Sorry about that with all the finals going on. It's been really busy for us, final projects on top of the finals we've been studying for. So I wanted to apologize for that. And then last but not least, uh, don't forget to check us out. Uh, we're on social media, Instagram at stronger underscore steel underscore NFL, Twitter at stronger underscore steel, Facebook, SoundCloud and YouTube, stronger than steel podcast. And check us out on, uh, at our website, stronger, uh, than steel or sorry. Wait a minute. I always forget this, man. I, what a rough day. Stronger than steel NFL dot blogspot.com. I always forget where the NFL comes from, but that is our website. One would think I would know that by now, but of course I don't. And uh, 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 it's frustrating, but you know what, Austin? I'm excited we get to go to a Steelers game. Austin's first game at Heinz Field, by the way, no less. So I know he's really excited about that. 
and we can't to wait to bring you some great coverage. Obviously, I won't be able to do the same things I usually do on Instagram this weekend, so um, just keep an eye out for that. So, Austin, if you're all set, I think we're all set to go to bed and get ready for tomorrow. I just got one question to pose to you because you said it earlier, and I wanted to think about it. I'll answer it first to give you time to think because it's more of a thinking question. But you said that the Eagles-Rams has potential to be game of the year. I want to know what your game of the year is. I'm going to start with mine just so to give you some time to think and maybe look over. Well, I'll just say that that's at least the NFC's game of the year, at least from what I've seen. Oh, no doubt. <sighs> the game of the year that so far for me this year has was easily the Raiders-Chiefs on Thursday Night Football earlier this year. That was one of the most fun games to watch, and at the end it was just craziness about all the penalties and flags of if the Raiders were getting that last-minute touchdown to edge out the Chiefs and stuff. Uh, that was my... Favorite game so far to watch this year. That wasn't a Steelers game. Steelers games are always going to be better than every other game around the year. But removing my removing my bias to what I thought was the best game of the year, I think it had to be that one because it just the score kept changing, it kept going back and forth. It was exciting every minute. Uh, so that was it for me. Did, did, did you I have one? one? And it's Week Three's Thursday Night Football game. As odd as a choice that is. I remember this game very well. I don't know if you do, Austin. It was uh, the Rams at the Niners on Thursday night football, color rush jerseys. Jared Goff went off 22 of 28 for 292, three touchdowns. And so did Brian Hoyer, who's no longer on the Niners. 23 of 37 for 332 and two touchdowns. This was a great game. It was one of the first really good games of the year, and it won't hold up, obviously, because the Niners are awful, and uh, it's a thir early Thursday night football game, but... The Niners fell behind, geez, what was the score here? 14, 10, 10. All right, so 34 to 20. They fell, they fell behind 34 to 20, and uh, they scored 19 points in the third quarter. It just wasn't enough. I forget exactly what happened, but I know that, yeah, the Niners scored a touchdown. They got the onside kick, but turned it over on downs right after that. So they had a chance to win the game. So it ended uh, without the comeback being complete. But a 41-39 final, that was my my game of the year right now. But obviously we have that huge NFC uh, matchup going on this week. And let me just find that. All right. And then obviously next week everyone's going to be interested in the Steelers and Patriots. Because no matter what happens, even if the Patriots win this week and the Steelers lose this week, a Steelers win there would put them in the driver's seat for the AFC. So... The same could be said for the Patriots if the Patriots lose and the Steelers win. So it's pretty much those two teams are set to compete for what's going to be the AFC AFC crown, or at least home field advantage in the AFC to get the AFC crown. So it'll be big time in Austin. Thank you again for joining me today, and uh, it's nice to finally have you here in person. Ready to go to your first Steelers game. We're going to have a great time. Can't wait to see you all there. Have a good night. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.